Welcome to Fireside Giants. My name is Alex with my co-host here, Anthony Rivardo. If you've been tuning in with us over the past few days, it's been a wild sequence of events, ranting about Jason Garrett, ranting about this offensive line, Dave Gettleman and some of these draft selections, and just the team as an overall disaster, top to bottom. But we want to talk about a couple of things that are occurring today. Um, <laughs> and ultimately, you know, some good, some bad, mostly bad, and, and it's a derivative of bad. You know, everything that's happening is a derivative of bad. And the first thing we do want to discuss today is the Giants bringing in Isaiah Wilson, um, you know, kind of first round talent bust uh, with the Tennessee Titans. They brought him in another Georgia guy. You know, he's buddies with Andrew Thomas. Um, you know, they have that connection. He's from Brooklyn, so maybe he has some family here. And he he seems to be turning a new chapter in his in his story, hopefully for the most part. But we'll discuss that. Anthony, before we dive into some of these things, maybe Jamie Collins, uh, the prospect of potentially signing him to replace Blake Martinez. Is that something we should consider? And Forrest Lamp, another free agent uh, guard that may be able to replace Brad, Ben Bredesen, who suffered a hand injury, wrist injury against the Falcons. We're going we're gonna to break this down, take a look at a couple things here, Anthony. But what are you thinking so far? And how's your day going? My day is going all right. Of course, I'm still feeling the effects of that loss on Sunday, but I'm going to go ahead and try to move on and look ahead to next Sunday and discuss now Isaiah Wilson. I think that was an interesting signing by the Giants, a kind of low risk, maybe high reward. I don't think we'll ever reap those high rewards and benefits because I think Isaiah Wilson just isn't it, but it is a low risk, high reward signing where he could potentially turn out to be something better than what we already have. And that might not be too difficult considering what we have is Nate Solder, right? So I like signing Isaiah Wilson to the practice squad. I think that was a decent move there. And then they have another couple other moves that we're going to discuss that they could potentially make on top of that. Still, I feel like it's going to be too little too late. The season already feels out of reach, but might as well make some of these signings and try and improve the team for the future and see if we can build off anything. Well, that's the hope, right? Isaiah Wilson is an interesting story. You know, he coming out of Georgia, coming out of college, has some behavioral issues. You know, he was caught with a DUI. He was evading police officers driving 140 miles an hour with weed in his car. Um, and these are all things that kids do, right? This is, and most kids don't even do this. This is stuff with kids with money and, and, and no real support system behind them might be doing. Isaiah Wilson ruined his career early on, but it wasn't because of his lack of talent. It was because of his carelessness and his lack of, um, you know, discipline. And I think that's something that stands out tremendously. It all got thrown back in his face, right? He got, you know, cut from the Titans. Um, he doesn't give a crap. You know, he goes over to Miami. They caught him. He, they doesn't, he still doesn't give a crap. He's trying to turn a new chapter, you know, turn over a new leaf. And it's just not working out for him. But we've seen this story before, haven't we? We've seen DeAndre Baker go down this same path. You know, um, whether it was, you know, true or not that he stole anything, you know, he was alleviated and absolved of any of that stuff. Um, but, you know, of course, he was not hanging out at the right place at the right time. He got himself into a couple messes. And I think that for the most part, you know, all this money, all that attention gets to some people. And Isaiah Wilson is one of them. And it really threw back in his face, um, you know, all the hard work he put in during college to become a first round overall talent. Now, I will say this. He posted on Instagram. He showed some pretty serious remorse for his actions. Uh, he vowed to be better. He said, you know, I've realized I've used this time off to think about my actions, to really learn about myself as a human and hopefully turn the chapter and get into a better place. If there's any place to do that, I think it's in New York where he comes from. Some people might say, you know, being in New York, he's going to be around people that, you know, are bad for him and this and that. But maybe he's around family. You know, maybe he's in a good, a better place. Um, Joe Judge can whip him into shape. He has a, a former teammate in Andrew Thomas that can really help guide him and, and really help him get to that talent he actually is. And he's a good player, guys. Isaiah Wilson, at the peak of his prospect, was a really, really, really special talent. Now We can debate probably, that. Well, I mean, okay. But again, better than what we have now, by a long shot, you know, at right tackle specifically. And that's, and that's the thing I want to make here. You might say, oh, Matt Pert's better, but come on, dude. There's a reason Matt Pert's not starting. And I think that I I want him to get well, reps too. I want him to get reps too over Nate Solder. But I end, wasn't end even going to bring Matt Pear into this. Though. I wasn't even going to discuss Matt Pear. I'm just saying when I watched Isaiah okay. Wilson in college, I wasn't very impressed. He was towards the bottom of my offensive tackle rankings. You know me, Alex. I did extensive film work that year because I knew the Giants were drafting an offensive tackle. I watched a bunch of film. I came away sorely unimpressed by Isaiah Wilson. But one thing that I did come impressed by or come away impressed by with Isaiah Wilson was his intangible traits, his athleticism. He is very athletic. He's a big dude that can move really fast, and he's very strong. It was all of the other parts of the game, like learning how to pass protect and learning how to, you know, put fundamentals to work. Probably he had a horrible technique. 
probably part of the carelessness, probably part of just being a college player. And the hope for the Tennessee Titans when they drafted him was, yes, he's very raw. He's got all these traits, but he doesn't know how to play the game yet. So let's get him in here and let's teach him how to play and turn him into an all-pro tackle. That was their hope because the ceiling is so high on those guys, right, who are super athletic but just don't know how to play. I liked – you wanted to bring up Matt Pair. I liked Matt Pair because he already had a higher floor because he did have good technique in college. So we just had to kind of mold it and perfect it and turn him into a good player. The Giants have been unable to do that, obviously. But with Isaiah Wilson, it's not too late because he clearly has admitted – if you go onto Twitter, you read the um, – the tweet that he has or the Instagram post that he has where he explained all of his struggles with his mental once he entered the league. He just needs to kind of get back into the swing of things and learn because he's got the traits. He's got everything there. He was just never taught how to play football at a high level. So, no, I, I don't think that at the peak of his game, he was ever that great of a player, but he was a phenomenal athlete. And that's a key difference. He was a phenomenal athlete. So you can mold phenomenal athletes into being good football players, but it takes good coaching. I think Rob Sale is a good coach. Let's see if the Giants are able to get something out of Isaiah Wilson because there is a chance that they could. Because, again, at one point, I didn't think he was a great football player, but I thought he was a tremendous athlete with the potential to become an elite football player if he was coached by the right people. So I didn't fully – I was never on the, oh, Isaiah Wilson is a good player train, as you might – disagree Alex and that's totally fine but I do see the makings of a player that can become a great player one day yeah I mean he's a he's a six foot seven 340 pound guy so he's a massive massive human being and like you said his biggest weakness is technique and that's the best weakness to have um, because it's something that you can fix you can't fix um, you know physical attributes sometimes whether it's short arms or longer arms or a uh, lack of quickness a lack of agility Rob Sale has proved to be a pretty damn good offensive line coach so far, considering the talent that we have on this unit, right? We're on to our, what, third left guard already, fourth left guard starting through three weeks. You know, we've been through Nick Gates, we've been through Shane Lemieux, been through Ben Bredesen, and now who knows what's going to happen. Maybe they bring in another guy. Maybe Matt Pert has been cross shooting a left guard. Maybe he kicks over to that position. So this is all up in the air right now. Now, I will say Isaiah Wilson is not going to start next week. He's not going to start the week after that. Maybe he starts by the halfway point, week seven, week eight, week nine. Maybe in that range, he's got to learn the playbook. Rob Sale has to get his paws on him. He has to really uh, start to define him as a player. Now, he's a versatile blocking guy. He can fit multiple schemes, which is definitely a part of why the Giants probably like him. But if he's willing to be disciplined, if he's willing to stay committed and be in the game and just focus on football, his sky is the limit. You know, sky is the limit for this guy. He, there is no cap on, his, on what he can accomplish but he's got to stay disciplined. That is the major thing here, Anthony. I think you hit it on the head with just his technique issues. That's his major issue here. Um, but he's shown dominance at times, you know, on tape at, in, at the collegiate level. Um, and he, you know, he's a five-star recruit. He's a massive guy. He doesn't have much bad weight on his frame. Really, really talented player here that has the potential to be a starting right tackle for the foreseeable future. But they're not gonna they're not gonna put him in right away. He needs to prove his worth. He needs to prove that Joe Judge. Um, you know, he's approved to Joe Judge that he can be a good guy, that he can go on on special teams and help block. You know, he needs to get onto the field first before we even consider starting him at right tackle, which is actually good for the Giants because the fact that he he is really kind of uh, fit at the right tackle spot is is perfect because, you know, you already have your left tackle and Andrew Thomas. Isaiah Wilson, if he's a long-term solution there, maybe he starts a couple games down the road, gets his feet wet, shows some good shows some good games on the on film. Next year, we have a guy, we're like, okay, you know, we have a right tackle. We're good to go. And he's young. He's like 22 years old. Um, he would be on his rookie contract still. So I think for the most part, the Giants are looking at this like, it's a win-win for us. If he fails, if he flops, we'll just cut him. No no sweat off our back. We don't care. If he pans out, you know, you just walked into a, right, a starting right tackle. That's a, a first-round talent. You didn't even have to do anything. So I think for the Giants, really good move here. And I think it made it even better that he's a Brooklyn native, so he has family around, at least as far as we can assume. I hope for that that that's the case. Hopefully, he doesn't fall into bad stuff back in Brooklyn. Um, but hopefully, you know, his family shows some good support. He's close to home, and the, and the Giants can keep tabs on him and really keep him in shape. And hopefully, he's turned over a new leaf and, and can be that be that type of player that we need, right? Yeah, and one thing that I'll say about Isaiah Wilson and really players of that archetype in general, when they are kind of this piece of clay that needs to be molded, it is hard to do to mold them into that good football player. There's something there that can make you a good football player, but it's hard to mold you into that. But it has happened. If you go ahead and look at Rashawn Gary for the Green Bay Packers, he's turned into a pretty decent player through two years. Now, of course, that's a different position. He's a defensive end, but he was one of those players that just had a lot of intangible traits, was really raw coming out of college, but they've molded him into a pretty good player so far. So really, 
All it takes is a good coaching staff to get the best out of its players. That's been a struggle for the Giants for the past two years, getting the best out of players and having a good coaching staff that can do that. But you never know. It's a low-risk, high-reward signing, so I am a fan. Yeah, I mean, I am as well. So let's talk about Jamie Collins. You know, linebacker, Detroit Lions cut him. What do we do here? Because you have Blake Martinez just towards ACL. He's done for the year. The Giants have Tate Crowder. They have Carter Coughlin. They have Reggie Ragland. Those are their primary guys. I know they signed another guy, uh, another linebacker to the practice squad, but don't anticipate him making a big impact here. The Giants have an, have really a decision to make. Do you want to roll with the youngsters? And Reggie Ragland, who you know is another Detroit Lions guy, um, you know, veteran coming over, or do you go out and sign a guy like Jamie Collins, who was the Lions' big, you know, free agent acquisition on defense, but has had a really tough start of the year? A lot of people, um, you know, in the Lions organization is saying that he just lacked effort, more or less. He's a he's a low effort guy. He didn't really care. He got paid, and then that was it. But they paid his entire contract, right? He's getting making like eight million dollars. Um, but for the most part, I think that the Giants are in a position now where they have to make a couple of tough spot, tough, tough decisions. And Jamie Collins might come on a cheap contract, Anthony, right? This is a guy who, for the most part, would be a cheap, probably veteran minimum deal, um, would replace Blake Martinez. At least you can work him and see what happens here. Do you think that taking a taking a shot, taking a flyer on Jamie Collins is the right move, or do you think they should stay away from him completely? Yeah, I don't think that they should go after Jamie Collins. I think that you're pretty pro-Jamie Collins. I'm anti-Jamie Collins. It's kind of, you know... Time for a little bit of a debate here, Alex, right? Because when I watched the the, um, the game where the Green Bay Packers torched the Detroit Lions, right? And Aaron Jones had four touchdowns. It was a phenomenal fantasy game performance, right? He was phenomenal in that game. But the main reason he had such a good game, I will put this on the video. Um, if you look at his receiving chart from that game, he had three receiving touchdowns, six receptions for 48 yards. He didn't run any phenomenal routes. We talk a lot about how Saquon Barkley needs to start running more angle routes, choice routes, stuff like that. Aaron Jones didn't do any of that. He straight sprinted to the flat and beat Jamie Collins to the spot every single time. Jamie Collins is washed. He's way too slow. He cannot keep up with a player like Aaron Jones or any running back for that matter. That's why he was cut by the Detroit Lions. He wasn't cut by, you know, the Buccaneers or somebody. He was cut by the Lions. So he's not even good enough to be on the Detroit Lions roster. I understand we have some depth issues at linebacker, the Giants do. But I like Tay Crowder. Let's continue to develop him. At least he's fast enough to get to the sideline. Jamie Collins at this point in his career is not fast enough to get to the sideline. He's not fast enough to guard in man coverage, just a flat route. So then what is he good enough to do if he can't even do the most basic thing that linebackers are asked to do? I'll put this chart up there. I'll send it to you, Alex. It's just really ugly in the perspective of Jamie Collins. And then you look at it from Aaron Jones's perspective with the three touchdowns, and you're like, what did he do? He, he ran sprints to the sideline. That's it. He literally just ran to the left sideline, ran to the right sideline, scored three touchdowns out of that. He didn't do anything special. He just kind of ran sprints to the flats. And that's because Jamie Collins is not fast enough to defend somebody now. He's just kind of a wash player, in my opinion. At one point, he was a great player in this league. But now, I think Jamie Collins is past his prime. I don't think that there's much of a point in the Giants to sign him. They also don't really have any money. The Giants are really tight on cap space. So even if Jamie Collins comes on a cheap contract, that $1 million contract is literally going to shred 33% of the Giants cap space. So I'm out on Jamie Collins. I'm not a big fan of the potential of signing him, the idea of signing him. I know a lot of people are going to disagree with me, but I think if you take a look at some of his statistics from this year, take some, take a look at some of the film and really kind of dive deep into Jamie Collins and look at, you know, maybe that just that route chart by Aaron Jones might be enough to do it for you. It's not a player that the Giants need right now. He's not going to fill a need for us. Tay Crowder will fill that need better than he will. And I, I'm just not really pro signing uh, Jamie Collins. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. I think that the only way I'd consider it is if it was a really, really cheap contract, right? Like last year, pretty solid season, um, you know, had 70 tackles, you know, he gave up 422 yards and two scores. But overall, um, he had a, he had a pretty consistent uh, season as a tackler, decent as a pass rusher, decent, inconsistent in coverage and run defense was also inconsistent, but decent. Overall, this season, he's completely fallen off, like you said, you know, this is a guy who 
they're saying lacks effort, and I don't think Joe Judge wants guys that lack effort right now. However, with the weakness there, I could see why they would take a flyer on him. I could see if he was on a minimum, a minimum veteran minimum contract, the Giants would say, okay, let's take a shot on him. The question is, why the hell would he want to come to the Giants? You know what I mean? Going from a losing team to a losing team. He could be like, I'll just take a veteran minimum deal and go to like the Buccaneers, or I'll go to, uh, I don't know, the Rams or something, and I'll be like, I will give the maximum effort for a very cheap, and I'll win a Super Bowl or get into the playoffs and actually have a reason to try. So, you know, this is this is a guy who also might not want to come to a losing team. You know, we're talking about should the Giants sign him? I think the question is, why the hell would he want to come to the Giants? Um, so <laughs> definitely, worth cons- definitely worth talking about um, if he lacks the effort. But, you know, we've seen guys – um, kind of do that in the past and just be like, you know, let's just go sign. Like, look at look at Richard Sherman. He just signed with the Buccaneers today on a one year deal, and him and Tom Brady have fought before. So it's like, you know, when it comes to winning, people people forgive and people forget, and people just want to go and win games. And that's why I kind of see Jamie Collins fitting into this equation. Like, I'll I'll be a backup on a winning team, and I'll put out maximum effort, but I'm not going to go to the Giants get my ass kicked every week and get paid nothing. So there you go. That's that's kind of my opinion. I think Jamie Collins probably avoid us just because just for that reason alone. Um, but I will say, Anthony, you know, when we're looking at this offensive line, how worried are you about the left guard spot? How worried are you about Ben Bredesen, who's been really bad, and Billy Price, who's been even worse? Those two guys together are, oh, my God. Like, oh, my God. Swiss cheese, just holes everywhere, bro. They they are so bad. They I watched. I just watched pretty much the entire game against the Falcons. They stood out on 50% of the plays as bad blockers. They were whiffing, missing blocks. Billy Price fell over his own feet at one point. Ben Bredesen was getting absolutely annihilated all game. At this point, give me Matt Skura at center. Go out and sign, and this is what we're going to talk about next, guard Forrest Lamp, who is a former Chargers guy. Just got fully vaccinated, so he's coming back to the league now. Um, and he's a, he's a former second-round pick. Pretty decent talent. He's a better pass blocker than Ben Bredesen, head and shoulders. I am 100% for going out and getting Forrest Lamp because we need we need someone to pair with Andrew Thomas. If you can shore up that left side of the line, DJ is going to have so much more time in the pocket. Our receivers are going to be a lot better. And I think the Giants are really going to be a lot better of an offense because they can let their routes develop um, for a little bit more time. Um, hopefully by the end of the season, if you had four slam and Isaiah Wilson, you know, you had that right tackle kind of, kind of short up, maybe left guards playing a little bit better. You know, DJ's not sitting there getting absolutely destroyed because Nate Solder's a walking turnstile on the right tackle spot. Anthony, you know, what are you thinking about the left guard spot? Do you think that maybe they should consider Forrest Lamp as an option there? Yeah, I definitely think they should consider Forrest Lamp because they should be considering just about anybody. Um, what I've seen from Ben Bredesen has been woefully uninspired and same thing with Billy Price. Uh, Billy Price, I want to touch on him really quickly. He is not a good football player. Like, he's just not. He trips over his own feet. He's got just a lot of pass protection problems. He's not very good as a run blocker either. He is well below average. The Giants are really feeling the loss of Nick Gates right now with Billy Price going out there and playing. Ben Bredesen, not much better. He's not playing good football either. He's missing blocks as a lead blocker. He's very slow out in space. That was one thing that we were talking about with Shane Lemieux and Will Hernandez, the whole idea of how the Giants like lead blockers and they like athletic offensive guards who go out in space and make these blocks downfield. Ben Bredesen is whiffing on like all of those lead blocks. Like He is just not playing well. He's also not doing well in pass protection. The Giants have clear issues at left guard and center. So if they are going to bring someone in, Forrest Lamp does have a pretty good track record. He's healthy now. If they do want to bring one more final piece in at left guard, one more final guy to say, oh, let's try and fix this one last time, Forrest Lamp might be that guy who can come in and maybe fix it. I'm not really sure if he would be the solution. He hasn't played football in a while. He's coming back from an injury. But – Honestly, he can't be much worse than what we have out there right now. So I'm all for it. It's worth a try. It's different from the Jamie Collins thing to me because I don't think Jamie Collins is better than what we have. I like Tay Crowder. I like Reggie Ragland. I like Carter Coughlin. I don't like Ben Bredesen, Billy Price, or anybody else on this offensive line for the most part, minus left tackle Andrew Thomas. So, yes, Forrest Lamp is a good fit with the Giants based on need, based on low risk, high reward. It's more similar to the Isaiah Wilson signing than it would be to a Jamie Collins signing. So I'm happy with that. I would be very happy if they actually did go out there and get Forrest Lamp. I'd still be happy if they went out and got Austin Ryder, who still hasn't been signed. Keep that in mind. There are a couple moves that the Giants can make, but how many backups do you have to sign before you realize, oh, we just have a bad offensive line and we need to make this a focal point in the offseason? We already did that rant yesterday, so I don't want to get into that too much, but this is a fundamental issue from Dave Gettleman. He sucks at finding offensive line talent. He really just 
isn't good at building an, a, a team in general. So there's plenty of, that I can rant about, but I'm going to bite my tongue on that for now and just say, yes, I would be very happy with a Forest Lamp signing. What the Giants have out there at left guard and center right now is unacceptable, and it's going to get Daniel Jones killed. It is. And, and you know, this is a problem that we've been facing for years now, right? The biggest concern to me, and I can't say this enough, the second Daniel Jones shows some signs of progress and development, the entire team falls apart. Someone's got to hold Dave Gettleman accountable, right? Someone's got to say to this guy, Dave, you promised us a better offensive line. You promised us that we're going to go with the young guys. You promised us that we had we have more confidence in the guys and the fans and, and media do. And look what they've done so far. You know what I mean? They've gone out and they've actually traded away important pieces like BJ Hill, who's having a great start to the season, one of our best interior pass rushers, traded him away for a former first round bust in Billy Price, who has looked absolutely abysmal. I'd rather just start Matt Skura. He's a much better player historically. And at the end of the day, it can't get much worse than Billy Price, right? I think that, you know, this is a situation where the management is really holding us back, right? We have talent, you know? And, and, and speaking of talent, I just watched the, the film, like I said before, and Kadarius Tony had two catches. They were back-to-back, -back, right? Both of his catches were back-to-back. -back. That was the only two catches he had. He had three targets on the day, two catches back-to-back, -back, and both of them nearly resulted in first downs, right? One of them was a nice little slant, and then he ended up traveling across the line of scrimmage. He absolutely put a guy on skates. It made me think of that longest yard guy, uh, Chris uh, Berman. He's like, he's like whoop. Whoop. And that's what, it, that's what it, it sounded like in my head when he made that move. I was like, oh, my God. Like, he's talented. Get the ball in his hands. He'll make plays. The other, the other opportunity he had was a nice little bubble screen. It was actually a really nice design play. Um, it was really a hesitation bubble uh, screen to the outside. And, and it was a fake jet sweep. Uh, DJ drops back on the fake jet sweep. It was supposed to, he looks to the right and then he just waits, waits, waits. Kadarius Tony's wide open on the left side, gets some blockers out in front of him, and he almost gets the first down. You know, he, he probably could have cut inside and uh, picked up more, maybe a touchdown, but he still almost got the first down. So, like you see, he's a talented player. He made a couple guys miss, and this is a this is a, a Giants offense that like refuses to get the ball into their best hands. I mean, look, Kenny Galladay just said, and this this really really pisses me off, right? So somebody asked Kenny Galladay why he isn't why he doesn't have any deep catches this season and his response I don't really have an answer for that. How infuriating is that? I don't really have an answer for that. Meanwhile, Saquon Barkley yesterday after the game is out here saying we have to start believing in the scheme. They don't even believe in the scheme. The players don't understand why they're not getting the ball. The players don't understand what's happening. Is it Jason Garrett? Is it Daniel Jones? Is it the the blocking? Like they're at a loss of they they don't know what to say. You know, they're like, we just don't even know at this point. We don't have an answer. That's a big problem. They don't have an answer for why the offense sucks eggs, okay? Now, Anthony, how does that make you feel that Kenny Galladay is out here saying, I don't even know why? And you, I mean, you're a huge advocate for Kenny Galladay being signed here for the main reason that they would be going downfield more. They had one downfield connection on on uh, against the Falcons on Sunday, and it was to CJ Board. And Daniel Jones threw an absolute dime, right? Where is, where is Kenny Galladay? Why aren't they targeting him downfield? How mad does this make you? Because that was that's his main utility, really. Yeah, the main glaringly obvious issue that I saw with the Giants offense in 2020 was a lack of a vertical passing attack. When Daniel Jones threw the ball downfield, it was accurate, and he completed most of his attempts. Like His, his completion percentage was very high on deep throws. But this year, we're seeing the same thing where the volume of deep throws is very small. The completion percentage is still high. Daniel Jones is putting the ball in the right spot. He's making the throws. But there aren't many throws for him to make because the Giants just aren't running a vertical passing attack. I thought the signing of Kenny Galladay would change things, right? That's what we said, right? Joe Judge kept saying, we're going to play these players to their strength. We're going to build the scheme around the players and ask them to do things that they're good at, not ask them to do things that they're not good at. So you would assume after three weeks, Kenny Galladay would probably have like five deep targets. I think he has one and it was incomplete because it was good coverage because it was telegraphed and everyone knew it was coming, right? So... There is no creativity in this offense. We've gone over that plenty of times, but there's also no sign of playing to your player's strengths. Kenny Galladay is a premier deep threat in the NFL. He is one of the best, you know, just deep go up and get it players in the league. And he led the NFL in deep receiving yards, I believe, or was second in the NFL in deep receiving yards since 2019. Like his whole game, his whole MO is go downfield and make deep catches. The Giants are not using him that way at all. They're just like, okay, why don't you go out there and run a 10 yard curl? That's it. That's all they want them to do. That is the biggest waste of talent that I've seen the Giants use at, at any point in these past three years. Like This is just 
really like malpractice at this point to have a player like Kenny Galladay, the caliber of Kenny Galladay to go downfield and make plays deep 20 plus yards downfield. And then they just only want him to work within zero to 10 yards of the line of scrimmage. It's ridiculous. It's mind boggling. And it does speak volumes to the lack of talent in the Giants coaching staff, to be completely honest. There's not a lack of talent with the players. Kenny Galladay is a proven player. He was great in Detroit, but there's a clear lack of talent with the coaching staff that doesn't know how to make use of a talented player like Kenny Galladay. And that's the biggest issue. The Giants are not going to win games until they fix what's going on in the coaching staff. The players are good, but the coaching staff is horrible and it's holding all of the players back from being successful. Yep. I think, and I think that's what's becoming the most apparent thing right now. Um, there are a few individual units that are playing well. Like the offensive line is playing above expectations and they're still bad, but they're playing above expectations. Um, and I and I give Rob Sale a lot of credit for really whipping Andrew Thomas into shape and making him look as good as he has been um, and really fixing his technique. So really good job from Rob Sale getting Andrew Thomas into a spot where we can consider him a bookend left tackle now. Um, but again, like the talent they're giving him to work with is awful. Like I can't blame Rob Sale for Billy Price being a bust already. I can't blame uh, you know Rob Sale for Ben Bredesen who you know has never like really started a game before until this season. Um, then you know Will Hernandez is playing better and Nate Solder is completely washed at this point. So. You know, how, how are we supposed to give him, you know, any any justification or, any, or really put any blame on his shoulders uh, when all this is going down, guys? But just want to qu- give a quick shout out to our sponsor. If you want to get an advantage over your sports book, you need to download BetQL right now. The only app you'll need to make smart bets. Their best bet computer model scans over 350K. Unique bets per year to give you a best bet recommendation for every game across all major sports and give you the reasoning behind why you should place the bet. Their model covers everything from spreads, over and unders, and player prop bets. Don't want to use the model and prefer to do the research yourself? BetQL has all the necessary tools for your research needs. There is sharp data so you can see who the pros are backing, line movements so you can jump on betting opportunities in real time, and team summaries highlighting previous success against the spread and the over-under. Head over to the App Store or Google Play Store now to download BetQL. You can also head to try.betql.co slash fireside to get started now. Enter the discount code FIRESIDE at payment checkout for 25% off any of their subscription offerings. You can find all this information in the description of this video. Make sure to check out their BetMGM offer in the description in order to receive a free year of BetQL. Also, check out their sportsbook offers page if you live in one of the eligible states to claim free offers upon signing up at one of many sportsbooks listed. Go check that out, my friends. Make that money. Make it rain, as FanDuel would say. <laughs> but guys, you know, I, I really I don't want to continue talking about um, the, the coaching staff here because for the most part, it just gets me more depressed every single day. And they seem to be falling apart at the seams. The one thing I do want to discuss before we wrap up here is Joe Judge saying he doesn't really want to believe in analytics. And I know, Anthony, that's going to drive you crazy. It, when I read it, I was taken aback of words. His, his exact quote went along something like this. If, if Excel was used, if Excel was the reason you win football games, Bill Gates would be the best in football. You know, Bill Gates would be the best head coach. I think... That was probably the dumbest quote of the year so far. Like, had to be up there with one of the stupidest things I've heard in a while. Why not just say, you know, we're, we're trying to incorporate analytics, but I also have to use my gut at times to feel the flow of the game. That would be a lot better than making a dumbass metaphor. Sometimes, Joe, you just need to stop speaking. He's sounding really defensive lately. And that's what's really concerning me. He sounds really defensive, very aggressive with the way he's answering questions, Anthony. That that says to me there's fire under his butt right now. He's on the hot seat because guys that are not on the hot seat don't sound like they're that they're defending themselves against the media. They sound confident. They sound like they're going to get it together and that they don't have to defend themselves in a way that really comes off as dumb and so you sound like an idiot. That was a really stupid thing to say. A lot of people, you probably was like, oh, people agree with me. Nobody's agreeing with him in this. this is, that was really, really bad, Anthony. How does that make you feel? Because I know you're an analytics guy. You like to look at the numbers. I do as well. Um, but even I'm sitting here like, you know, analytics is such a big part of sports right now, especially football, walking over that and ignoring it and and going off of gut is why you're 0-3. Yeah, how does that make me feel? Um, Not good. It kind of makes me feel crushed. It kind of like really hurts my chest and my heart because I have self-proclaimed myself as the leader of the Joe Judge fan club. One of the reasons I did that is because when he got here, he mentioned analytics and how it's important and how it's a tool that the Giants need to utilize. I didn't expect him to make a mockery of it at any point during this season or at any point ever because he said that it was important. So to hear him making a mockery of it has me considering disbanding the Joe Judge fan club and stepping down as the leader of said club. I'm going to try and see it through just a little bit longer, but that one really hurts because when you look at the analytics, right, and you look at 
tools that can make you better. Like you are the head coach of the New York Giants. If you are shunning any tool away, you are doing a disservice not only to yourself, but to your team and to your fans. You should be taking every tool at your disposal and considering them and not making a mockery of any of them because they all have value. All right, I get it. Pro Football Focus, the grading scale isn't that great. There's a lot of flaws within it, but they have advanced stats and analytics outside of the grades. The Ignore all PFF grades, but then take the stats that they give you, you know, completion percentage over expected, things like that, and A dot, all that kind of stuff, war, wins above replacement. Take those things into consideration. That's how you build a team. That's how the best NFL teams in the league are building their teams using war, wins above replacement. They're not investing solely into the defensive line. Okay, they're investing in the positions that give you wins above your replacement level players, you know, like quarterback, like receiver, like cornerback. The Giants started to get that right, I thought, when they drafted left tackle Andrew Thomas, and they put an emphasis on adding playmakers for Daniel Jones, but then they went ahead and didn't use any of them. So clearly the coaching staff is now the ones who are falling behind in terms of analytics and using players to their strengths and getting wins above those replacement level players so really to tie all of this together with joe judge he made a promise this now looks like a false promise he made a promise to use analytics and use all the tools at his disposal and make this football team better now he's making a mockery of one of those tools that fans really wanted to see him utilize we know he's not utilizing them because of those punts on fourth and three from the 39 yard line every analytical stat sheet that you ever look at for that situation will tell you to go for it analytics say go for it at the very least kick the field goal he punts that ball, and that was basically a middle finger to everyone who believes in analytics. And then today, he kind of confirmed that middle finger with this quote. He doesn't use analytics. He promised us he would, but now he's not. And it's clearly hurting this team. I, I don't. I know there's a lot of fans who are much older watching this pod, watching or listening to this podcast, and they're you know saying, "Oh, I remember the old school Giants. You just walk up to the line of scrimmage, punch you in the mouth, and win football games." Okay, but the reason that the Giants were good back then is because they had guys like Bill Belichick and Bill Parcells. Bill Belichick and Bill Parcells were progressive-minded people. They did not live in that mindset that you think they did of just go up there and play hard football. No, they were always looking for an edge. They were always looking to get a greater edge using analytics. It wasn't coined analytics back then, but they were using data. And one of the ways that Bill Belichick separated himself from others is because yeah, he had Lawrence Taylor, but what did he do about that? He didn't just have Lawrence Taylor run out there and run the scheme. He built the scheme around Lawrence Taylor. He would pull Lawrence Taylor into the locker room during halftime and say, what did you see out there? What do I need to make adjustments for? Let's build this defense around you. Then they would build the defense around Lawrence Taylor. Lawrence Taylor would go out there, have two sacks in the second half, and the Giants will win because of that. The Giants coaching staff is not doing anything like that. So yes, the Giants back then were the old school Giants, but they were progressive in the way that they coached and the way that they thought about things. They saw star players that could make an impact on the game. They took that player, built the team around that player, built the scheme around that player. The Giants are doing the opposite. They're trying to plug Kenny Galladay into making curl routes and stuff like that. So yes, this started off as an analytics discussion, but people don't understand analytics is a greater discussion to be had about data and about the way that you use your players and put them in position to succeed. So when Joe Judge is making a mockery of analytics, it really speaks volumes to all the other issues that we're talking about. When we're talking about how Kenny Galladay is just running curl routes all game, well, the analytics would tell you Kenny Galladay should be running deep routes all game. He shouldn't even be running any short routes. He should just be going deep because the PFF advanced stats will tell you he leads the NFL or second in the league in the NFL in deep receiving yards, okay, since 2019. So if you take that statistic, That's the one you should be building your team around. You should be building around that PFF stat of him being one of the best deep receiving receivers, not having him run curl routes. So I get it. A lot of people don't like PFF. I don't blame you. Their grades are kind of wonky sometimes. But if you look at the statistics and you look at the true data, even go to next gen stats if you don't like PFF. Next gen stats will tell you the Giants are sorely misusing guys like Kenny Galladay, guys like Saquon Barkley, even because they're not running any outside zone with him. They're just putting him up the middle every play. This is an outside zone runner. This is not an inside zone runner. So you want to talk about analytics, you want to talk about applying data to your football team. Joe Judge needs to get on the same page, needs to get to the modern NFL standards. Look at the best offenses in the league. Look at the Packers. Look at the Buccaneers. 
Look at the 49ers. Those guys are using analytics. That's where you see pre-snap motion come into play. The Giants aren't using a lot of pre-snap motion. Analytics say pre-snap motion can actually bring you wins because it makes your offense that much better. So the Giants are falling behind. They need to start to get modern, start to get progressive, use analytics, really just re-envision the way that they use all of the players on their team because they're not using them to their strengths like Joe Judge promised they would. So Again, this is a false promise from Joe Judge, has me really questioning him as a person, as a coach, and has me really questioning whether or not I want to continue to be the leader of this Joe Judge fan club, because right now, that club is in shambles, it is about to fall into ruins, I was hurt by this one, I was very upset by it, but hopefully, maybe this is a wake-up call to him, he hears the feedback, and Joe Judge can maybe try and put a little bit more of an emphasis on analytics, and putting players in the position to succeed, but right now, I know we didn't want to rant too much about the coaching staff. This is going to be my last rant probably of this week because we've got to turn our attention towards Sunday. But right now, I am in shambles, and this coaching staff needs to be in shambles soon enough. I really think it's time for the Giants to consider making wholesale changes on the staff, particularly starting with the offensive coordinator position. Yeah, and I will say, I think your point, um, specifically talking about how they're avoiding playing to players' strengths, is the biggest takeaway from that entire rant you just had. And, and like you pointed out, like Bill Belichick and, and Bill Parcells were thinking, you know, they're in, let's say they're in the 80s, right? They're thinking 2000s football. So they're way ahead of the curve. The Giants are playing 80s football. So they're way behind the curve or to early 2000s football. Like they're playing smash mouth football inside zone with a, with a scat back. And it just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any physical sense. Kenny Galladay, as you mentioned, is a downfield threat. Why are they not using him in that way? Who really knows? You know, they're not. If, Jay, if I was Jason Garrett, I would sit down with Kenny Galladay and say, let's design a couple of plays right now that will scheme you open. What have you done in the past? What, what kind of plays have you liked with the past that you were with the Lions? Um, you know, give me, give me some things that you like to do, and let's fit those into our scheme, and we will target you. We will make sure you'll be the second read. We'll look off the safety, and we will target you downfield. How can we do that? Jason Garrett doesn't seem to be doing that. He seems to be putting square pegs in round holes. Let's use another Joe Judge metaphor that makes absolutely no freaking sense because he's not actually doing what he says. This is the thing. The Giants talk a lot of shit. They talk a lot of good stuff, but they don't put it on the field and they don't execute. So how are we supposed to continue trusting these guys if they cannot execute and they talk a lot? You know, it, it, Actions always speak louder than words, and it's time for them to actually execute and show us that they know what's going on because clearly it, Jason Garrett's scheme – Look, we, we can go over this all day. A lot of people agree. Some very few disagree that it's his fault. But we have the talent, guys. Kadarius Tony getting two touches last week is a malpractice. Malpractice. Saquon Barkley being an inside zone runner, malpractice. Kenny Galladay not being targeted downfield and CJ Board being the guy running nine routes, malpractice. Evan Ingram being even on the field at all and Caden Smith sitting on the bench, malpractice. This team is in shambles because the coaching staff does not know how to use their players, guys. But... That, that's the end of this episode. I, I, I could go on like this all day, but I, I just don't want to before I get really, really angry. But once again, thank you to our sponsor, BetQL, the only app you need to beat your sportsbook. Find their information along with a 25% off discount code in the description of this video and also check out their special BetMGM offer in the description in order to, in order to receive a free year of BetQL and other sportsbook signup offers and bonuses. Of course, make sure to subscribe below to Apple, Spotify, and YouTube, and we'll catch you guys on the next New York Giants video. Mm -hmm.